First off, I'd like to thank the organizers for letting me present uh, the work that we've done in MX over the last few years. So my name is Kate and I'm going to present to SDU, our smart digital user. And this is the software that we use for our high throughput automation and unattended data collection at the Swiss Light Source. Uh, so for some quick context, um, I am part of the MX group and we have three experimental end stations at the Swiss Light Source. So we have uh, what's called PX1, PX2 and PX3. The first two of our beamlines are um, in vacuum undulated beamlines and have IGA detectors and smargon um, multi-axis goniometers. And our third beamline, which is grayed out, um, is currently part of the phase zero um, builds for the SLS 2.0 project. So currently we're only running with two beamlines and our PX2 beamline is quite special because this is our partner beamline. So we have nine partners at the bottom who fund and predominantly use this beamline. So to try and have um, nice robust uh, solutions for our software, we have a small team inside the MX group called MX Data and we use up-to-date um, latest technologies to try and innovate and utilize the most recent hardware and software developments. And the goal of this development is to try and have expandable and sustainable software, which can be supported and developed by a small software team. So the overall architecture of our data acquisition stack is a microservice architecture. We have a... Um, a user sphere of influence, which is inside the purple to the left. So the user will interact with our graphical user interfaces for the robot sample changer, data acquisition, and serial crystallography um, graphical user interfaces. They will also execute data acquisition jobs with our data acquisition server and be able to view the process and results. So we have an abstraction uh, layer between our GUIs and our hardware. So we call this the escape, which will maintain different states that our beamline should be in for sample alignment, data collection, and sample exchange. So if you're a user collecting at one of our beamlines, this would be the view you would have of our console. You would have your data acquisition server in the top left. You would have your data acquisition GUI in the middle left, your robot sample changer, the tell GUI in the bottom left. In the top right, you would have the diffraction viewer and we use Albola um, for viewing the live streams and for um, review of the grid scan data. And in the bottom right, we have our tracker, which gives us the live updates um, with server sent events from our processing tracker and database. So some of the recent developments we've had um, since 2020 have included a lot of hardware infrastructure. We have a new sample changer at all three of these beamlines, which is in-house developed. And we now have a capacity of 30 Unipucks or 480 samples in the one robot duo. We can exchange the samples in as little as 20 seconds. And we also have pin detection capabilities, which really helps increase the robustness of our system. We've also recently finalized our fast fragment compound screening uh, facility as part of our crystallization center. And this is very heavily based upon the XCAM solution at Diamond. And in the last year, there's been installation of the brand new Smargon MCS2 with the new control system that my colleague Wayne yesterday presented. So we've got now a way to produce many samples, mount many samples, and then align many samples. So following all of these developments and contributing with the corona pandemic, at now 100% remote, we had to really drive forward the development of the automation software to catch up with all of these um, upgrades. So we've had to update our robot GUI, so the TEL graphical user interface. We've also implemented automatic loop centering at all three of our beamlines. And then using all of these services together, we've created the smart digital user, which performs our unattended data collection routines. So what this means for our overall data acquisition stack is that we have the nice new TEL graphical user interface that our users can utilize. We can now remove the user if we so wish and if they so wish. And because we've now removed them, we still need to send to the samples, which is where we bring in our automatic loop centering software. 
And then from here, we're able to replace the data acquisition GUI, which required manual intervention with our smart digital user. So this can now perform the unattended data collection. And in the future, what we want to be able to do is extend that capability to do our serial crystallography collections as well. And a more recent, um, in the last few months development was we've migrated our database from on-premises to a cloud solution in Zurich. So for the TelGUI, this was written uh, predominantly by my colleague, Zach, and this is a PyQT GUI. And this is built, up, built upon the uh, P-shell abstraction layer that um, our controls uh, engineer had built for us for the Tel um, robot. And what we have now is a sample spreadsheet validation. So, and both our Tel GUI and on a website that our users are able to log into with um, LDAP and Active Directory authentication, they can make sure that the spreadsheet that they're uploading um, matches what we require for the sample loading uh, data processing and data acquisition. So to achieve this, we have Pydantic data models that we're using. And this really just makes sure that we know that what comes in isn't gonna break anything downstream and it gives the users and us peace of mind. So the TelGUI itself, this is what you'd see in manual mode. But for automation, when we activate that, we get an unattended tap. And here we're able to observe the current state of each of our samples, whether they were currently being run at a different step, successfully completed, skipped a step, failed a step, or if they have not yet been measured. So this is all updated um, through our broker and we persist this information in Redis as well in case our GUI closes, we can reopen it and recover the state. So we have five core steps, the safety, mounting, loop centering, diffraction centering, and data acquisition. So for the loop centering component, we had to make a lot of hardware and software updates. So for our undulated beam lines, we have a very shallow depth of focus and a small region of interest. So we first needed to align our sample roughly to the rotation axis, which is aligned, of course, with our beam and our camera. So we have a camera that's mounted above the diffractometer that is looking down at our sample. So we're able to align this um, as the other devices are moving um, in the escape state. So then when we get to our sample alignment stage, our sample is already in focus and view. So we can do our second uh, component, which we call center to flat. And this is where we find the flat face, the thickness and determine where we're gonna perform our raster scan. So this is just a slide to show the vast variety of loops uh, that we deal with. This is by no means exhaustive, but one of our challenges was to make sure that we cover all the different loop shapes. So the smart digital user itself, um, this is dealing with the communications between all of our different services. So we'll have the mounting with the robot, our loop centering, our diffraction-based centering, which we use our AirTech for, which we can do at 50 to 100 hertz, as well as our data collection, which we typically do as well at 50 to 100 hertz, and then the display of our information to users in a Polymer-based web application. So it's really important to highlight that this is only possible through the hard work of everyone in the team from having good hardware, good software solutions, good file systems, networks, and with the good data acquisition server and now loop centering, we can have the SDU run and have this run reliably. So I'm not brave enough to do a live demonstration. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a video for everyone. And this is of uh, our PX1 beamline. And this was earlier in the year when we had our smog on and this installation um, can do quite um, high ranges of kite. So what we're watching at the moment is our robot has come in to mount our sample. And as this happens, we can see um, that our pre-location in the bottom right has already started to try and align our sample to our rotation axis. And then we're having the updates from the tel GUIs to say that it's going now to sample alignment. So now that we are in this mode, our sample's in focus in the bottom middle so we can start aligning, rotating, fitting our sinusoid to get the large, uh, largest area, flat face, thickness, and now it's finished. So. This information with the bounding box will get sent to our smart digital user and it will use those coordinates to calculate where it's going to do our raster scan. So we can see now a little running man in the top left. Oh, I went backwards, sorry. Uh, technical difficulties. Too brave. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. So our diffraction centering is running uh, now. And all of these images, we're taking the zero MQ screen, 
and um, processing them live, the stream on our computing nodes using label it and spot finding so that the results are instantly available for SDU to make the decision on where it should align first. And now we're doing a secondary alignment at 90 degrees. So now once this is done, SDU is able to determine, yeah, this is where I want to measure the data. And now we're going to collect the data according to the information that our users provided in that spreadsheet. Um, so we're going to collect at three different chi phi pairs. So we'll start at first chi zero phi zero, and then our final measurement will be at chi 40 phi 180. Um, so I'd advise looking at the bottom left screens and the bottom right, it's quite nice to see. Um, so all of these uh, data acquisitions are done successively. So we can send the one scan request um, which contains all this information for the server, and then it can successively do these collections for us. So we can see our chi has started to change already for our second measurement. And this is where it's really nice. This is where we can see our chi 40. And then um, our colleague Dominic did a really good job with the calibration. So we're able to do all of these measurements at different chi fires and our sphere of confusion is quite small. Um, I think it's as little as seven or five microns. Um, yeah. So then once it's done, SDU will signal like, hey, I want the next sample. So we'll do the safety checks, move everything back to the correct escape state. So in sample exchange mode, so the robot can then come in and unmount our sample. So all of our data, and um, this is getting processed in the background. So we can see here, we get the live updates in our Polymer web application. We're getting the, the stream updates. Uh, so we get three uh, data set collections because we did three different chi fi pairs. And then all of this is getting merged in the background using the HKL from the first data set as our reference. So one of the nice things with SDU as well is we can run this overnight. So we quite routinely set this up and then let it collect 300 samples overnight. And once it's finished all of the measurements, it will unmount the sample and return the beamline to a safe state. So we'll put everything, like the samples back into the robot drawer. It'll move the devices to a safe place. And then it will also automatically generate a PDF report, which has information of the data acquisition. Um, so we get a pop-up and it tells us the directory path we need to go to. So you can say, okay, we can go to that directory path. And when we open it up, we'll have a summary view, which is quite similar to what we have in the tell GUI. However, we also have information upon the grid scans. So we see what the values were, what position was selected as well. So if you open here, we also get water, uh, watermarks with the beam line and the beam size that was used for measurements. And then we also get to see um, what the best grid box position was and what the value of the spot finding was for that. So this is a nice overview in the morning to come in and see, okay, do I need to remeasure anything or is it okay? And then also there's more detailed information for each sample um, in an A4 page. So then for the ADP tracker as well, um, we're able to export this information as a PDF and we have three different pipelines we run. We run an in-house um, GoPy, which is mostly XDS space. We have um, ZIA2 dials, which we've recently implemented, and Autoproc, which we have been running now for quite many years. So this can be saved and then combined, the user will have all the information on the data acquisition and of the data processing. So throughput wise, we can get through um, soundly 20 samples per hour. This can be increased depending upon the data acquisition settings. So this is assuming a 360 degree data collection. And with doing multiple uh, chi angles, I recently did an experiment where I compared two times 180 degrees at uh, chi zero, chi 20, and I found that it had very minimal effect to do the multi-orientation data collection as opposed to a single 360 degree data set, which is good news for the low symmetry um, systems. So our slowest beamline is our PX3, um, but hopefully after SLS 2.0, it will be uh, much faster as well. 
So this I'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone involved, especially Justina Wajdila, who was uh, really driving this as the group leader of MX Data. And also, of course, to Controls, Science IT, the MX team, and our SLS user community. And if anyone is interested, we do have a group leader position open because um, Justina is going to the US. So please have a look and apply. And thank you for your time. Okay, open for questions. Just one question. Uh, when you dismount your sample mm -hmm. and you mount it back, uh, is your hardware guaranteeing the same orientation or you have to find, it, to find the orientation again? You have to find it again. Yeah. What's the success rate of your automatic surveys? As uh, pretty high, it's over 99%. So the failures that I get now are mostly if there's no pin, because um, that still falls under the uh, range, or if there's icing problems. So sometimes what we find is that if there's too much ice in the base, as it melts, the sample will move. So to try and compensate for that, what we do is we um, automation, if it fails at the loop centering, will automatically trigger that process again. So then it's given enough time for our blower to warm the base up. Maybe I'm going to ask those questions. Maybe a little bit hypothetical or not. How difficult or is it possible to adjust the system for a different detector? Uh, so we're currently at our PX3 beamline. It was a Pilatus 2M that we run it for, and we have IGA 16M and IGA 2 uh, 16M. So we have three different detectors at all three of our beamlines. Um, I think it should be relatively reasonable just the day plus the area detector and it should be I, I think it should be fine um, any other questions i had one i was wondering yeah uh, on the, at the srf and a number of other facilities we use this database called ice by b mm -hmm. i notice you don't have that is, is that considered something uh, that is not you know are you thinking of going in that direction or not uh, yeah, so we, um, one of our big projects at the moment actually is to try and have similar capabilities okay. to that. So unfortunately, we are limited in resources. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I'm the database project <laughs> at the moment. So um, we want to be able to achieve similar capabilities to what's available in Sync Web. That's mm -hmm. something we're really lacking and that our users would benefit from. Because what you showed in the PDF report. Yes, yeah, so it should be in a database. It absolutely. Database. 100%. Thank you. Well, thanks again. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank you.